Thank you. It's my very great pleasure to uh, introduce a lady who really, for all of us here, doesn't need introduction, but we, uh, we should give a, a tiny bit of background. So, Kakia uh, Chatsu. Kakia graduated a PhD from the University of Essex. Um, and her PhD, she's a true, fully-fledged, card-carrying linguist. Her PhD <laughs> was in computational linguistics, um, a study of uh, syntactic issues in Greek. Um, and she's done a lot of work in computational linguistics, particularly in the LFG framework. Um, she can weave magic in Greek syntax using the... Um, XLE parser. The par the XLE parser, yeah. yeah. The XLE parsing program, uh, which actually ultimately came out of research at Xerox Park and, and at Stanford. So um, if you ever want to see um, how a computational parser and so on operates, then Kakia um, can uh, demonstrate that for you. Um, following gra graduation, she went on to a position at the UK Data Archive, which is based at the University of Essex. <coughs> and then she joined us here at SOAS in May 2012. So uh, she's been here almost two years now. And working here as the digital content curator in the Endangered Languages Archive. And we were incredibly fortunate to be able to get somebody with the linguistic knowledge, the knowledge of um, digital curation, of archiving, the broader networking and connections that came through the, her work at the uh, UK Data Archive, plus the fact that she's a fabulous person and uh, really easy to work with and talk to. And through her work in ELA, she has had huge amounts of interactions, working with depositors, potential depositors, future depositors, helping them to understand um, the whole process of curation and getting their materials ready and so on. Anyone who's had any interaction with Kaki will just know how generous um, a person she is, as well as incredibly knowledgeable in linguistics, linguistic theory, LFG, curation, archiving. Um, and today she's going to share another aspect of her um, interests and knowledge, and that's a secret language from Greece called Balearica. Thank you. Thanks for all your kind words, and Peter, and thanks to everyone for coming here. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Can you all see the, the slides all right? Good. Feel free. I don't have, I won't expect to um, keep you here for the full hour and a half or hour for that matter. So uh, if you have any questions as I go along, please interrupt me and, you know, raise your hand and I'll be happy to interrupt the the actual talk with uh, questions if something comes up because um, as I will explain this is all very uh, um, work in progress so um, it stems from um, uh, a discussion I had um, about um, six years ago no it was more than that uh, seven seven eight years ago with my late grandfather about um, a mysterious language that he heard that somebody was um, able to speak uh, so i'll give you a little bit of background about my kind of uh, story with this and that's where my adventures come with this so um a little bit of background about the language um it is currently an endangered uh, once secret professional language spoken in the villages of Kravara, which is um, nowadays known as mountainous Navpaktia, which is um, um, central Greece. Um, I don't know if anyone knows where uh, Navpaktos or Patras is. It used to be called Lepanto, and doesn't matter, I'll show you a map. Um, so, uh, people, uh, the, the the whole area. My, I'll try. I'll show you a couple of uh, uh, photos of old pictures of it. it. It is a place very mountainous, and you know, in the very kind of Greek way of it being loads of loads and loads of rocks, uh, no soil whatsoever. So uh, the word kravari um, used to mean. I don't know if it currently means. That's one of the, of the kind of things I'd like to find out and check. Um, it used to mean a rocky, steep, and barren place where nothing actually. No, where you have no land that you could actually um, uh, grow plants on. So um, 
some other people say actually the name comes from um, a very old uh, war cry um, that the populations of the area used to say to uh, their enemies, which means, head me, hit me to the head, which means I really, I'm not afraid of you, you can hit me wherever you like. And the um, karan means in ancient Greek, the head. So they used to get to say, stin karan varite, karan varite, kravarite, which was the name of uh, the area. Kravarites is the, the name you would call the population of Kravara. Um, they um, are reportedly, because I'll, I'll explain what I mean by reportedly, they, they were populations that were isolated geographically, so because uh, accessing, moving from one uh, village to the other was very difficult and took a long journey. Uh, so even though the, um, they were very close on the map, the, 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 the villages I'm going to show you, because they were, they were in different mountainous places, you have to go all the way up and all the way down, the, um, the mountain to be able to reach the next village. And that used to, it had to happen sometimes, uh, some areas nowadays are even nowadays not accessible by a car. So it used to be happening by using a donkey or a, um, a horse if you were a lucky person. So you can imagine that populations uh, would have to, I mean, the land you couldn't cultivate to produce food. You'd have to find an, an alternative source of um, and a certain way to feed your family. So what these people would do, as I, as I will explain in a minute, they would try, they were, they became, they, they were, uh, they were um, considered to be really clever and good survivors in whatever climate and whatever circumstance. So they were very resourceful in trying to find ways of either getting money or getting the, the, the um, to getting whatever they needed, the, the family was needed to survive. Um, I'm by no means an expert, um, I'm still exploring the field myself, but a couple of thoughts about secret languages. Um, the literature distinguishes between different types of uh, secret things. Oh, that's, that's not supposed to happen, it goes on by itself, sorry. I hope it finishes there and doesn't move into the next slide. No, it does. Um, okay, so, um, so let me try and, s and pause that, I'm sorry. Um, Pause that. Good. So, um, so the the, the 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 literature distinguishes between different types of secret languages. So you can have uh, code languages, uh, languages where you, for example, just replace uh, the word for another, or you add uh, an affix in between and repeatedly. So, like um, much like um, is it pidgin English, a similar one. Pig English, pig in pig Latin. Thank you. Sorry. So pig Latin. Um, you you might get um, other um, um, other um, secret languages such as slang or um, uh, which is uh, what people would use. Depend. So uh, slang words are things um, words that perhaps uh, within a, um, um, an age group words that only that particular age group would use or um, not necessarily secret ones but um, they would be particular to that particular group uh, jargon is what is defined in literature as being uh, the uh, language of professionals so academics have academies they speak a particular language that not everybody understands uh, quite often uh, adds to the barrier of these two um, groups, the academics and the general public. And you get the Argo or um, sometimes um, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language which is again used by a professional group, only that that, that professional group is not necessarily a legal one. So, um, so they sometimes get involved into criminal activities and that explains why they need a secret language and that's to hide what exactly they're doing. So um, um, Languages, secret language, as any language, is a tool for communicating something to somebody. Um, so the particular and interesting aspect is that it's very close within the particular community. So the community wants to preserve its identity and will, will use that um, language, that secret language, uh, to uh, exclude outsiders. Um, so knowing the language means that you are a member of the group and that you um, um, sometimes just knowing that language means that you're accepted within the group. Um, and um, 
As far as I have found out, they're usually the same grammatically, so uh, they usually do not present a very interesting syntax. Semantically, they're very interesting. Uh, pragmatically, they're very interesting. And uh, there are loads of variations in the lexicon, so you will find loads of loans from other languages that they've um, assimilated and reusing uh, with a different meaning. Um, you might uh, have uh, words substituted for something else, so... Um, uh, I'll show you some examples. Uh, we have the examples of, uh, in, in Bolarica, we have an example where uh, the word for letters and sciences is the word for light. And so I'll, I'll show you some examples, perhaps it's easier to uh, um, explain. And then, of course, you have, in the case, of course, of code languages, one way of doing it is to add or repeat affixes in um, either part of the, so the same um, consonant with another vowel or uh, any variation of that. Um, so some thoughts again about secret in-group languages and language endangerment um, have to do, has to do with the fact that secret languages serve, as I said, a particular use or function, that of including or excluding and that of identity. So when the function no longer exists, they are the first ones to go. Um, and all, um, quite often in the literature it is mentioned that um, uh, they are the easiest ones to die because um, it's knowledge you don't want to pass on to outsiders, even though the function doesn't exist. Um, oops, keeps moving on. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so attitudes towards secret languages and their speakers are quite often negative, and that goes back to uh, like negative connotations about what this group is doing. So in the case of uh, illegal activities or activities that need to be protected by a secret language, then that's what happens. Um, now, um, back to uh, Bolyarica and the, what I'm talking to you about today. So it is spoken in Greece, um, that's where Greece is, and it's spoken in that particular area of Greece, which is central Greece, and it's spoken in, that's where the area of Nafpaktas and Patras is just opposite, I mentioned a while ago. So the, the little points in the map shows where, where the, the, var the variation I'm looking at, um, at so these are all very um, uh, the, the, the mountains of, of um, Nafpaktos, and it's um, there are variations of the same um, secret language or alternative languages for other professions elsewhere. I'm going to mention a couple at the end, but I'm not going to be referring to them, them at all. And here is a better map uh, from Google um, uh, showing the points where I've. Um, uh, through liter literature review and through uh, speakers, I found where it, it was used to be spoken. Um, so, it, um, who speaks it then? Who are the the people who used to speak it? Um, um, th this is something I can definitely give you information about. Who are the people who speak it right nowadays? That's something I'm still looking at. So, if you have information, by any chance, please tell me know. Um, so they are the peddlers of Kravala, so they are the poor, very poor people. Uh, they were resourceful, as I said, very hardworking. When land was not providing enough, they became peddlers, uh, earning the living trading across the Balkans or immigrating abroad. Um, and the secret language was, was used so that the outsiders could not understand them when they were trading or when they were travelling. So it was purely, sometimes for deceit purposes, so they would like steal when they were selling something to you, or sometimes it was it was just to make sure that um, news about the world or news about their trade was not, or the, the actual trade itself was not passed on to other people. And here are some professions that, um, n well, some of them are actually, if not most of them, except for the musicians, perhaps. Quite a few of these are actually extinct as professions themselves. So that goes back to the function that I mentioned, the fact that we no longer have a wanderer milkman um, who goes around and gives milk. So there's no trade like that, so there's no need to have the language at all. So we now go to the supermarket and buy milk. Uh, same goes with the ice cream seller. Um, that's no, no, no longer um, something you would find uh, in the streets of Greece or even in, the, even in that particular mountainous area. The yogurt seller, definitely not. Um, music, musicians, you would definitely find them. Uh, festivals going around from village to village playing music, that's, that's certainly something happening. 
uh, barber and practical doctor, no way. Um, so um, by practical doctor, I mean the dentist, the person who would stitch you up, things like that, right? So, um, and the peddler seller, which is very close to the profile of the people I'm looking at, is a person who would have a carriage or some form of um, uh, cart to push, and they would have loads of items there that they would go around in villages and sell. Yes, sorry. I don't know. I think it's beginning of last century, so 1930s, 1920s, but I don't remember because it was a long time ago I came across. But I think it's definitely definitely before, so it was um, before the Second World War, so 1920s, 1930s. Any other question? Okay, I'll move on. So... Um, I've yet to verify that with actual speakers, but the literature mentions that the language could have originated in the 19th century with the aim of keeping the Ottoman uh, Turk masters from understanding their communications during their occupation and oppression, but carried on using it after the area was freed from the Ottomans for different reasons, because they wanted to, 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 to you know, conceal something else, some other activities. Um, uh, Fermor, who's one of the travelers and one of the people who mentioned that language and actually have a, a dictionary of vocabulary at the end of the, uh, the travel book about of the, of the language. So it's one of the resources I have used to um, um, testify to existence. Notes that the locals still called poli policemen, which is normally in the colloquial um, uh, slang, even nowadays, Batsi, which is, means cups, they used, to, they used to call them completely different, which is uh, with a completely different word called patelos, uh, in order to communicate unobstructed by official intervention. So even that, so he went there in 1957-58, so wrote the book in 1963, so um, they were still there, they were still speaking the language. Uh, so that gets me a little bit, so I think, before I move on to attitude, I'll just give you a little bit of background about my own uh, journey into finding out about this language. So, as I said, it was something that, um, so um, a couple of years ago I was doing my degree in linguistics, um, Greek linguistics, uh, University of Athens. So uh, it was then that, so when I had, it was my first year as an undergraduate, that my granddad asked me, what is it that you're doing there? So I explained to him what it is that I was doing there. And he said to me, you know what? Um, um, I know of a language, or I don't know if it is a language, uh, that um, when I was very young, people used to talk about it as being a language that only a particular group of people used to, to know. So, um, do you want me to find more about it? And I said, yeah, sure, if you have anything that I can work with, or if you can show me something, then I can... Um, do something with it. So he found one of his friends and colleagues, um, friends rather, but rather than colleagues, um, and he sent us back four pages of A5 with loads of words. Quite a few of them were swear words, as was quite often the case with uh, some of these secret languages. But um, it was amazing to see that the words that I got were, as I said, either... I could sort of understand why they would call something as what they called. So th there was a resemblance to uh, some uh, equivalent Greek words, but the, it was completely different. The meaning of the actual Greek word was completely different. Um, and then some others was completely, completely, some, you know, totally different. So I tried to ask around in my university and say, you know, have you heard of that language? They said, no, we haven't heard anything about it. So I carried on, moved on, did a, came here, did a master's, uh, 2007 or 6, I went to, uh, um, I think it was the Relative Clauses Conference in Cambridge, uh, back in 2007. Um, so I met Jeff Horrocks, who is one of the big uh, guys in um, uh, Greek linguistics. So he asked me, do you, uh, I asked him, do you know anything about this um, dialect at all? And he said, no, I haven't heard anything about it. But why don't you ask the University of Patras? They have a centre of dialect studies there. Um, now, just to make to cut the long story short, no one knew anything about it. So it was just me and my granddad knowing about it, and perhaps this is the other person who had given me this list of words. 
2009, some very old manuscripts, back from 1915, um, from a very old linguist called Manolis Triantafilidis, who is one of the founders of Greek linguistics in Greece, um, was digitized. So he had uh, four pages of A4 in very old uh, paper that uh, he had word lists of that language. So he had mentioned, I'm going to show you in a minute the picture. He had a list, so he had the, um, the Greek, the Bolarica in one list, he had the Greek equivalent, and he had the German one as well. So because that was the, the, the language of the uh, philologists at the time. And I think quite, it is the case right now as well. So whoever does ancient, ancient Greek or Latin, they, they more, quite a few of the literature is in, in German. So that was my first uh, kind of uh, uh, bright moment of saying, yes, I'm not crazy. It still exists. Here's somebody who says that it exists. It's there. So let's go on and try and find out more about it. So that's my little journey up to now. So back to this a little bit, um, uh, just quoting uh, a couple of things about the attitudes to speakers reported in the literature. Um, they had developed the reputation, Marin 2008 says, uh, among other Greeks for sharp dealing because any visitor from outside the area was suddenly plunged into a neighborhood in the middle of Greece where people seemed to be speaking this, his language. So it sounded like Greek, right? But where he could not make a head or tail of what they were saying. So then that was done on purpose. Excuse my peas on the mic. Um, Current status, as I've said, of the language, very endangered and ex extinct. Very few speakers remain. Um, at the moment, um, um, I know of only one person in Greece who's researched them who's alive. Um, and uh, also, um, go back, go back, sorry. And also, um, I know of two speakers that I've tracked down that are both in their early 80s and scatter all over Greece. So one is in uh, Athens, another one is in um, Thessaloniki. So um, some studies um, into language, um, I, have, I also have some, some mentions in the literature and uh, quite a few um, um, information from um, traveller, um, so people going around in Greece in the 1950s, 1940s and writing about it. Um, and then the other problem is that um, all populations have settled in since the 1940s and they are scattered all over Greece and abroad, so it's quite difficult to track down, so it's word of mouth and um, also the fact that um, people that are willing to help are usually the people that are know my family and who I am, and that's why they agreed to tell me about it. Um, so here is what the word list look like. So this is a, a printout of the, like a screenshot of what the uh, manuscripts look like. Uh, I have a link at the end of the presentation if people would like to go and have a look. Uh, it's free online now, it's a PDF. So um, that was my moment of joy. So there's two word lists. One is uh, Bolarica. As you, I don't know if you can see that. Yes, it's here. Here, in Greek script. And then the second one is the one uh, annotated with uh, German translations, as well as with some um, sociolinguistic circumstances that the guy, um, Manol and uh, sort um, found out when he was visiting the villages. Um, um, this is the person I um, mentioned, Manolis Trindafili. This was a linguist and major representative of the demotic movement in education in Greece who compiled a comprehensive grammar of the modern Greek language that is even nowadays taught in schools. Um, if you don't know what the demotic movement is, feel free to ask me afterwards. I'm not going to go into this. Um, in the literature, um, I have found... As I said, um, these were lists as well as um, um, an article he wrote with somebody else in 1915, uh, where he mentions that the language that the Kravritas Berger speak, especially in the village of Perista and Perkos, which are the islands I'm focusing in, um, um, they were kept among the manuscript collections of the Institute for Modern Greek Studies, and as I said, they were digitized very recently, fairly recently. Oh, 2006, sorry, not 2009. Um, second point of reference was um, 
Um, go on. Patrick Lake Fermo's um, adventures, uh, books, travel books. Uh, he was a Briton who spent many years traveling around Europe and Greece, and um, he visited the region in the 1950s. And at that point, there were local people who were using this dictionary, this, sorry, this vocabulary. But they didn't necessarily know why or what that was. Um, so um, he recorded as much of, he, of the language as he could um, in his book. Um, and as he mentions, it would be a shame if this curious secret language should vanish unrecorded. And I have, I don't know, can you see the, the letters? So I'll read through it and excuse my probably horrible bollarica at this point. Um, so question pointing to my eyes, what are these? Tamatia, which means the eyes. Diflia, Otia, the last plainly slav from Ochi. And this pointing to my head, Tokefali, the head. Koka, Karoni. And these waving my hands, Tajeria, Zograña, which means the, um, Zograña is, it's the tool that you use when you dig, oh, um, they man sorry? Spade. Thank you, the spade. So spades for the hand, right? The manners that two sound inexistent in Greek with these, that's why I'm saying I probably do not pronounce that correctly right now. And that, yenya, which means the beard, um, pointing to Father Andrew's beard, so he was a priest of the place. So, maratho, which is fennel, a foot, how do you call a foot? Topodi, which is in Greek, right? Vatso, he said. Mustaki, the moustache. Uh, Duki, so the duke, right? The duke has a moustache, so the moustache is called the Duki, or Duki. Uh, door, uh, sorry, that was Greek. Door, um, porta, uh, which is do uh, door in Greek. Chapraka, which is the Bolarica one, right? So, um, interestingly, um, I know a couple of these, I can get why they are called like that, but it would be interesting to see where the actual, how they, what, where it comes from. So it is very different in, it, in its own respect as a language. Um, so this is the, the person alive I mentioned a while ago. So Tsuknidas, he's a researcher in the Academy of uh, Science, Sciences in Athens. Um, so he's... Um, one of the very few people who have done linguistic work on it. So they've taken the data and done some field work um, to collect some words and vocabulary. And he, um, he has a paper where he looks at verbs and uh, roots, verbal roots. So the most recent mention it uh, work looks at productive roots and suffixes, compounds, words that change their meaning in the plural. And of course, he mentions that the verbal nouns of the secret language of the Cravaritas, beggars and peddlers are relevant to the natural needs, money, and something that you can't see because it's taken away. Um, so it's naturally it's money and other things, but the issue is that's very limited in its vocabulary because it, it served particular needs. So they only had, he claims, vocabulary for the stuff that was interesting and relevant to what they were doing. So um, one of the questions that I was um, asked is, why should we care? It's long dead and gone. Uh, no one's using it anymore, probably, and those who do or know something about it are too ashamed or too afraid to say anything about it. Um, so I find it particularly fascinating, as um, some of you in this room might also do. It's a language, in the, the language is a mixture of uh, Demotic Greek, so modern Greek as nowadays spoken, or as it once used to be spoken, and loans from languages spoken in the areas the community came in contact over the years. So Turkish, Bulgarian, Slavic, as well as ancient Greek and onomatopoeic words. So I'll show you in a minute the word for goat, and you tell me if that reminds you something. So the, cust the culture and the customs of its speakers will be lost within the next generation if they're not lost already. So most of the ped peddlers have settled in since after the 1940s and the remaining speakers are all in the late 70s and 80s, as I said. And loads of the professions, which was the function of the language, is, are now gone. Um, and 
it is also a, a very interesting example of how changes in sociocultural and economic factors may influence language contact and result in language endangerment. So it is very interesting to me to find out how they heard about these songs if they were isolated in the mountains. So how far up or how far down could they go or who was how could they have heard about these words and incorporated them into the dictionary so there's quite a few for work to be done with respect to how these populations moved the geographical spread and so on and so forth and here are some examples i hope it won't move on on its own if it does i'll, I'll move it back so um Again, with my horrible Bulyarica pronunciation, because I, I'm not a native speaker of Bulyarica and I haven't heard it being spoken. Um, so, Bokla, um, so, which is hair, it's very, very close to the demotic Greek for Bukla, which means curly, curl, the curl of hair. Uh, here's an, an interesting one Platanophila, which um, in Greek means uh, plain tree leaves, it stands for paper money, so colour. Is an one obvious link that we can see there. Kutiu uh, is um, the house in Bolarica. Kuti um, in modern Greek is a box, so the, genit the genitive case of that is kutiu. So why and as to why it is like that, uh, it's an interesting thing to look at. Foteri or futiri, um, drachma, which used to be like euro. Um, it's a very ancient coin. Um, light, phos in Greek. So why? I don't know, but it's interesting. Um, the fotori, so two drachmas, right? So you can you can actually have a compound of um, the currency there. So twice. Giona, which is the mountain very close to Athens, is Athens. So uh, we have. So um, they were referring to the. A city using the mountain that was close to it. Hina, which is the goose in modern Greek, stands for a thousand drachmas. And that's a word, I don't know if it's a word that was firstly used in that dialect or not, but it's a word that has passed on to our current slag, slang. So people would use it to refer to thousand bucks or euros. Usually, usually thousand drachmas back in the days. So I don't know if they would use it for euros nowadays. Um, Fotera. So um, is the letters and the sciences. And again, force is the light. And interestingly, you have a, a word that looks very close to the money to mean the letters. So foteri and fotera to um, denote the two. Lachanidi, I don't know if that's pronounced like that or not, would be the knife. Where lachanida in Greek is the cabbage. Now, why would you do that? I don't know, but that's the beauty of it, I guess. Karvuni is a train. Karvuno in modern Greek is uh, coal. So, train uses coal, so you would refer to it in a slightly different way. Velazura, that's the example I mentioned about onomatopoeic words, is the flock of sheep and goats. And velazo in, in Greek is bleat, so bear, bear, or ba, ba as sheep do in, in the UK. So um, so you can see that the sound becomes a word and that the word gets an affix attached and becomes plural and it means the whole, he the whole, the whole flock. So that's from Demotic Greek. Let's have a look, of, uh, let's have a look at other words, All right? Eskebes is the Peloponnese, so it's the area like central Greece, but underneath. Um, some people say in the literature, does that come from Turkish eski to mean old, so it's old land. Um, other one, other examples. Ingotina means the person who's married. Um, so gotina, and excuse my Slavic pronunciation, or gotina. Nadia, you might be able to help, no? I'm not sure. No. It might be some kind of old Slavic. Maybe. Yeah, but. means cool. You're very cool. Cool. Okay. So it's a gentle one. Uh, according to the, the, the um, Fermo 1963, that's what it means. But uh, as I said, I don't know any, any, um, any, any of these languages. So it's, it would be worth. An, it's, it's another PhD, if, what people say. So it's another like, thing that I'd like to look into to try and work with somebody who knows these languages and see if these links are indeed there. Um, Gotimeno, 
um, married, so the um, so the first one is for the female. So it's got the a, ah, which is the female affix at the end. The um, uh, the second one, gotimeno, is for um, male or neutral. So for kids or um, so gotopulo, not kotopulo, which is chicken in Greek. Gotopulo is uh, the um, the son uh, or the young gentleman. So the the, the affix pulo in uh, in in Greek is it denotes somebody who is the son. So like Stephen's son or um, son of somebody. So like Arabic has al, I think. Um, Maletsko is the child, and Maletskas, who is the, so as is a very productive affix to mean somebody who does something, um, is a teacher, so the, the person who looks after the teacher, the, sorry, the children. Um, Verdilis is the father, Verdilo is the mother, is mother, and then some interesting ones, which I think are from either Bulgarian or Russian, uh, Cielo is, or Selu is the village, and the uh, Bulgarian, or perhaps the Russian as well, is, uh, te, is it Selo or Tel? Silo. So it's the village. So you see, I'm pronouncing it in the wrong way, probably, because, you know, you get that E rather than, the, yeah, Selo. So Terkuva uh, is the church. Terkuva? Terkuva is the, the church in Bulgarian, or is it in Russian as well? Close enough. Close enough. So I'm looking at you, Nadia, but I know that you, you, you are a native speaker. So. Um, so any questions about anything that's on this table? Or should I just move on? Um, and here are some verbs. Um, so uh, they use the... Uh, so the evo, iso, ao, ano, ano, ino, ado, ado, and azo are very productive verb affixes or suffixes in Greek, so you attach it to uh, nouns and adjectives to form verbs. So here are some examples. Um, um, I'll pronounce them horribly. Anisevo, I grow angry. Karkevo, I hit. Siorevo, I get drunk. Sosior used to be a way that you would refer sometimes to the gentleman. So I don't know why that would be. Uh, manizo, I steal. Tsumizo, I kill. Sarafizo, I understand. Glavizo, I run. Um, banizo, I understand. Here's another word that has entered our current Latin slang vocabulary. Um, it means um, look, I look at something or I look at something that's really nice in the way that a man looks a woman, or a woman looks a man, or the other way around. So, Kranizi, um, it rains, and that, 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 th that, le that, in that very first term uh, goes back to Kranion, um, which is the head, and uh, we call Kraniu Topos, which means the place, the head of the place is the place with loads of stones. So, Here's another um, possible way of interpreting that. Fotao goes back to fotari and other uh, words we, we talked about. So I know, I see, I look out for. Um, and moving on to um, pantelado, which is the one um, before the last. Uh, I talk nonsense. Um, and to, to me caso, which means I sleep. So... Um, before I move on to some information about what I intend to do in the future, are there any questions or any 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 useful um, observations or remarks? Yes. I'm just wondering where you got all this data from. Is it just from the word lists. Yes. Yeah, so this data comes from the word lists and Tuknidas uh, um, analysis of verbs. Uh, so he had access to some word lists that I can't find at the moment. So he reports that literature in there. So I've got these verbs as a, as a combination of what he presents and the combination of the word lists. That information comes from uh, the word list that my knowledge student Afrilithis has, as well as information from um, the um, firm or the, the, the excerpt, the vocabulary that he has in his, in his book at the end, for more the um, traveller person. Is that right? Sorry, Peter. Um, two questions. Yep. You said you got four or five or six pages of notes from your father's friend. Yep. 
Is that consistent with? It is. I've got. They, they have loads of swear words that I didn't want included in this presentation. I don't know. I'd like. I'd like to test if to first. You know, make sure that they're. Yeah. So, um, so, but apart from that, it is consistent. And I've also found out since then that Tsukunidas, um, who is the person I'm, mention, I'm, I'm uh, referencing here for these um, verbs, has since gone and done some more field work on another var variant of Bolarica spoken in another place, not in, in Nafpaktos. Very close by, but not not the same. So um, that's another point of uh, line of um, investigation I need to, to look at, see whether it's the same language or whether it's, it's different. So that's your question. The uh, second question is that the British guy that you mentioned, hmm? he only died three years ago. Did you have a chance to speak to him? No. Him? No, I didn't. Do you know if he has any notes or anything else that wasn't published? I know that he has a third book that he will be publishing, or he, a member of his family, his editor will be publishing. I know also that he has archives. He has like um, notes, manuscripts that he, like notes that he took while he was out in the field. So uh, that's something that um, I need to also pursue and find out. So that would be really interesting if we, if I can find more material about. Uh, the, the time that he went there, so 1950s, and some notes he did. Because I'm assuming if he's presented just this dialogue, he'll have many more that he recorded in terms of information. He seemed, throughout his narration, he was very interested and he wanted to record. Now, he has a dictionary, like a word list at the end, but it would be worth looking at whether that's the end of it or whether he had any more material. So, thanks. Anything else? You mentioned Father Andrew. Yes. Who knew the language? Apparently. So he was a priest. Apparently, in the nineteen. He wasn't a beggar or a peddler or whatever. No. But he might have been in the. So I just wondered how he got to learn the language. Is it just simply because he lived there, or he was in that environment? How would he? I don't think I, I can answer that. I don't know, but I think you're very right. So he wasn't. He wasn't a peddler. If, I mean it. It, he he used to live there, so he used to live there in the area. So um, there is a point where, from the particular from the language of, so the group did not necessarily include only the people who were travelling, also included the people back home in the families. That's again an assumption from from the the information I've been gathering in the literature. But your your question is a very valid one. So if we claim that that was a trade trade particular language, then how come the priest of the of the village knew about it? You knew everything. Yes, the priest always knows everything. Uh, the, the priest and the teacher apparently. That these are the best people to to get started with when you're looking at doing a uh, field work in, in Greece. Then uh, they will get you very well connected with loads of people and they were very well they're very well respected in the community. Uh, but uh, also my uh, one of the assumptions or one of the th points that things I need to to look into is that at some point, I mean, in the 1950s, it was very, very late in the in the whole story I'm, I'm talking about. So there was a point where, from a just very close group, it became perhaps the the language of everybody in the village, or every, everybody knew words of it because they wanted to hide from the police, or they wanted to hide the secrets from other villages, or. Um, but all of that is just, um, as I said, that I have no facts. These are just um, things that I can only infer from what I'm looking at in the literature. So it would be um, interesting to see what and how much people remember about it. Is that okay? Anything else? Any other questions? I'll just move on very quickly then. To that bit. So, uh, as as I've presented to you today, the bulk of data and facts I have is historical, anecdotal, and it's quite a, a lot of it is inference using different resources to pull down and see what was the reality and what happened. So, some data uh, are being held by the Athens Academy. So that's one my, my archiving, let's say, uh, research. Then the next point to do some archiving research, archival research, would be to go and look into that. Uh, the archives of uh, Patrick Furmore, as Peter said, was a very good idea, which is, thanks very much, I'll follow up. Um, so I'm currently in touch with two speakers, um, um, mainly um, I expect 
Uh, nothing really. Uh, so I'm looking forward to interviewing them and seeing uh, what um, they um, what they remember of uh, the culture and of what they remember of the people and the, the language. Um, I'm hoping to record some uh, tradition practices so people would describe to me what the practices were, what, where and how they were using this language. And also um, looking forward to any history because people love to tell stories about the past or stories they've heard from their grandfathers. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what um, they have to say. And um, I have established some links, but I am looking forward to establishing even more. So to be blunt enough, but maybe when, in the, when it comes to extinct languages, maybe it is, but... Um, I'd, I'd like to, to try and get as many as possible and um, I've received interest from the local library in the area in Afbak, so the University of Patras is the closest one and the uh, research um, group there um, to host the data and make them available to the local international, uh, international scientific community. Um, I haven't added ELA to that but uh, of course that goes without saying, right? So if I get some data then the first person, the, one of the first places to deposit it to, to would be the archive I work for. Um, so I'm hoping to have, um, in, like, uh, put all these word lists together, incl including the swear words, um, I try to get an idea of who its speakers are nowadays, like try and get um, a profile or um, try and get some information about where they are and um, if there are any, because maybe there aren't any, um, only past people who remember it rather than people who speak it, and how well, of course, they know the language or not. Um, and try and um, raise awareness. I haven't added that, but try and raise awareness of um, the fact that um, knowing that language um, or uh, being a, a descendant of these people is not necessarily something you should be shameful of. It's something that you should be proud of as part of your cultural heritage, as part of who you are and um, what you're doing nowadays. So, some other trade languages. Um, I'm just listing four, there are about ten I've found mentioned in the literature with a very little research on them, very little vocabulary or word lists on them, but nonetheless. So, Krakonika, uh, Bukoreika, Kudaritika, and Romka, which is the language of somebody we can't see. Uh, no, we can't see. Sorry. Um, something there. I might, I'll find it afterwards and I'll let you know. So, um, that's all for me. Um, thanks very much for your uh, for listening, and I'm really open to questions. Particularly interested in knowing if you've had we've heard of any similar circumstances or examples of secret languages in other parts of the world, not necessarily in Greece, um, and any 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 kind of experience you might have with uh, other communities. Thank you very much for your attention. Peter. Two comments. Mm -hmm. There's a language, well, so called language spoken in um, Spain called Mundarico, mm -hmm. um, which apparently had a similar uh, origin. I believe it, they were fisher people and traders, and they used to shout across the markets to each other, of, mm -hmm. you know, how much they were charging for things and so on, with, with this special mm -hmm. vocabulary embedded within a and I think it, it may be Portuguese or, or um, Spanish. Yep. Anyway, surprise, somewhat surprisingly to me, they managed to convince Dorbes to give them 300,000 euros to do research on this. Um, and they had a, they had actually had a conference recently mm -hmm. and a big... Did you go? Was it the one you went to? Maybe not you. Is that the one you went to? No, there was a big sort of European languages, mm. minority languages festival that oh, right. and so on. Oh, Ebony. Ebony went to it. I knew one of you guys went to it. Um, and it's all built to me, again, don't quote me, mm. turn the camera off. It's yeah. built on a scaffold of something similar to what you're describing, I believe. Mm. But they, they've got such enormous kind of identity issues tied up with it that it's now been presented as if it was this whole 
language, etc. Mm. Um, from the descriptions I've seen, there's a lot of metaphorical um, things and lots of similarities in, in, in ways in which you that mm. you've described. So, um, if you have a look at Mendelico, sure. it would be something to look at. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks. The second comment is one. Uh, it was a paper that was published a couple of years ago. Julia probably knows the reference better than me. And the title is something like, Don't Show Your Ass Cheeks to Us. Okay. Um, and uh, essentially, it was about a group in, um, in Mexico where the language is highly, highly endangered. And the only times when people use it is when they talk about the, the tourists wandering around the street wearing oh, right. their bikinis and their jeans and showing their ass cheeks to the, to the people. So the language is it's used and preserved in environments when specifically when they want to talk about these foreigners and outsiders and tourists. And when the linguist who was interested in working on this was talking about publishing, the community was absolutely against any idea of publishing or distributing anything about this particular language because mm. that would have then opened up the possibility that they were actually insulting these people and talking yeah. negatively about yeah. them. So all the swear words and all the negative stuff that you talked about, is it possible that you shouldn't be publishing that material precisely because it is the swear words and the negative material that if there were community members who had a relationship to that stuff, would actually think, no, the rest of the world shouldn't know about that because then all the Greeks will come along and they'll start using the terms talking to us. Or, or ah, they'll yeah, know, yeah. Or they'll know that this is what we're using. To talk I think about. that's a very valid point. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what the circumstances are with respect to Bulgarica, whether there are any speakers left and whether, whether there, no, there are some speakers, but whether it, it is a problem for, you know, um, not uninit uninitiated people to know about them. But this is, it, it, it raises a very interesting question as to um, why and how much and is it, is it some th vocabulary? So, so if, if the secret language was, was used nowadays, um, then I guess your point is very valid. So you wouldn't publish something that will, would put the, the whole community. So it would, you'll make the secret language useless. It wouldn't be secret anymore. So do that all the time. Yeah, I know, isn't it? So what's the point? I mean, of course you want to research it. Of course you want to, to, publish, to publish papers. Of course you would like to have your data in an archive. But if we're using it and it's a secret one, you better not do anything like that because, you know, I need to invent new words now do they do that? to um, be able to describe things. But there's a kind of broader issue, an ethic, a broader kind of mm. ethical issue, which, I mean, some Aboriginal communities in Australia, for example, have argued that they don't want any of the material in their languages on the internet. Mm. Even material that is, you know, digitized and available for download in other places, they don't want to have it, and certainly not tagged as belonging to their language or whatever, um, because they, it's, it's the one remaining last thing that they've got retained from their history the bits and pieces of heritage and so on that hasn't yep. been taken away from them. Yep. Um, I mean, that's a particular political, ideological and political position to yep. take, which some communities have done so. But lots of linguists are completely blind and oblivious to this, and, you know, they go ahead and publish all of their stuff mm. or whatever. Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, what with secret languages, you're even more, uh, it's even more an issue. Yep. Um, and maybe there isn't a community that can be re can respond to it, but it's yep. worth thinking seriously about mm. that as a, as a Absolutely. Responsibility. Yeah, responsibility of research. Thank you. Lydia first, then David and Candide. Lydia. Um, thanks for the presentation. Was really Thank you. There's also a secret language in the area where I work that's mm. used by the herbalists. Okay. We're experts about plants, and it has to do with um, calling on the spirit of the plant. So it's a specific name that they use when they want to ask for special powers from the plant when they go to harvest it. Mm -hmm. And um, being a secret language and having so much power, they obviously probably wouldn't want it published and available, but they said that outsiders can learn it if they go through the initiation process of becoming nervous. Okay. And that also information about the language could be shared. So they could say, well, you know, this particular plant does have a secret name and it is um, 
a similar, it's a word in the language, but it's not the same as the word that other people use for this plant. You know, they can say mm -hmm. things about it without necessarily giving away the secret itself. Mm -hmm. And that's one way that they've been willing to work with people. But I need to talk with them more about yeah. what they're doing. No, it's a very good, like, it's a positive way of taking. So, um, so you you can't you can't publish my data, but unless or you can't learn it unless you're an initiated person. So, not necessarily they, they don't sound like a very so they are a very closed society, but they they seem to be open, not particular because some of them are particular to the gen, gender specific, or there might be you know um, where that you come from. So you have to be born in this village, for example. So in your case, it's not. So that's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Thanks very much, Lydia, for that. Uh, David, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking along lines similar to what uh, Peter was uh, talking about, especially since you pointed out so eloquently the the relationship between the very instrumental function of the language and its continuance. I, it it um, made me think about a paper I just read about um, um, digital repatriation of uh, Cherokee formulas, I think they were called, this special incantations by medicine men, mm -hmm. where the Cherokee community members had quite a bit of controversy, mm -hmm. where some people said, yes, that's part of our heritage, but other people argued, well, if, if these have their potency by being secret, then these things should not be disseminated, for yeah. example, by archives. But maybe it's not just archives or, or linguists. I heard Julia say something about linguists do this all the time. Um, there's a case uh, a, a colleague um, has uh, told me about Polari, which is the, mm. like secret yes. language yes. here in the UK, which apparently was sort of all but destroyed when homosexuality became legal, and much of the language um, became used in mainstream media, like movies and so mm. on. So the, the function, its secret function, was removed, and the language all but destroyed. So it does raise the spectre of us as documenters actually, you know, destroying the languages, mm. to destroying the function. potential function. No, I think I think that's a very valid valid, valid point, David. Um, and it goes back to what uh, Peter said about responsibility and. Uh, it sort of clashes with our need to know more because as researchers we want to find out about the world that surrounds us. So we want to document and document and uh, pass on that information to the next generation. But um, everything should happen according to communities' wishes, I guess. So try and talk to them and see what they want out of it. Um, so very valid. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Candide. I wanted to ask you... I wasn't exactly clear how secret this secret language is. Because mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, these people, they were, some of them were settled and some of them were peddling. Was it the whole village would go off? Uh, nowadays, at, at, well, um, my, my, my research shows that, so what, from what the information I found out, it used to be nomadic in the early 19, um, 20th century, so the 1910s, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. It was nomadic. So it, they moved around and sell, uh, sold things around in villages. Um, after that, and on to, um, uh, so up until the 1950s, they had start, started to settle in, in different places, have a house. Um, have perhaps land, not necessarily in that particular area, elsewhere as well. So, so there was village. There were little there were villages. Little yes. Of the yes, there were villages that it was spoken. And the Boliaraki, Boli Boliaris. Yeah, they would travel yeah. to visit those villages. No, the other way around. They would visit. They would. They would start from these areas and go out and visit areas. So they were from that these villages. They would speak it uh, among among their uh, peers and among the the families. Sometimes later on, as I said to Nadia before, but they would travel. Were wanting to travel um, outside, and I don't know how far away from their home they would travel, but knowing words 
like the words they have in, or like the loan words, for example, would mean that they would have to travel away from the current mountain. They would have to go at least up until, you know, northern, north Greek, Greece. And do you have any indication of the same morphosyntax? No. None at all? No. So you don't know if it's just sort of, sort of different lexicalization or totally different morphosyntax altogether? No. I'm afraid not. So I don't. I am still in the very baby stage of trying to find out instances of words of that language. Um, I had um, had time establishing it as an existing, as a dialect that used to be spoken. Um, and um, I've so at the moment what I'm aiming for is to try and get as much vocabulary, um, and perhaps um, some narrations from remembers about what these people used to be like. Because I've got third party perspectives, but not community perspectives about who these people are and what they think of themselves. So, thanks for the question. Uh, Lutz. Um, <coughs> yes, thank you. I, I think what is interesting here is that, from a general perspective, the relation between, between secret languages and trade languages, mm -hmm. because they don't necessarily coincide, no. but in your case, do. Um, and and the, the, you know, the social linguistic impact, if you like, of the trade language, because in the, the different, I guess, more West African context, um, you have blacksmith languages, mm -hmm. um, and that's the distinct trade language goes from the past from father to son, and it's very, very secretive. Um, and that, but there is, there's a real sense of also the magic and the unknown, the work with fire, um, but but there's also there's social distance, but it's not looking down like what you what you have in mm. your case, I guess. Yeah. Um, and on the other end, lots of lots of secret languages I come across are, are related to youth, to mm. youth languages. So it's age group yeah. defined yeah. rather than trade defined. Yeah. That's that's very alive and very active. There's there's stuff in Musheng, is a typical example in Kenya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, in those cases, sorry to not you, but that, that they, they just come along and, and document them and publish them, and then the young people quickly make up some more. Yeah, words, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. There, I think documentation of the issue because it's yeah. much faster than, than you know, academic publication can ever be. I think it's cool to go in the first place. Yeah. It is exciting, though. <laughs> Doesn't this also serve as a reassurance for the young generation that their, their, their language now has a status of being recognized by linguists? So, so it adds up to the prestige, I guess. It does in a funny way, because it's the wrong people who think it's good now. Because okay. academics are too old. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, right. I'm cool. <laughs> OK. Interesting. Cool. Well. What's the name of the language again? Sorry. Uh, what was? Schengen East Africa. Okay. There's loads. Of, uh, any, any any capital city you mentioned, like London, is London multicultural English, also known as uh, Jamaican. Mm. All right. Thanks very much, Lutz. And Julia as well. It's a related question, perhaps, about the social linguistics. Sure. I don't understand whether we know if this language was spoken to children at all. Because some of the examples, mm -hmm. including perhaps the one you gave, if I understood correctly, the implications that you have to be allowed before you are allowed. Yeah, so, so I wonder about the implication for language acquisition. I have no information, I'm afraid. Um, again, uh, all the mentions I have is of people who could trade, <laughs> so people who could work. But at the time, you know, 15 year old, or 14 year old, or 13 year old was old enough to work. So. Um, it is a very interesting aspect to look into and see was it something that was very similar to what Lydia mentioned, was it something that there was an initiation process, was it something that people learned to use because they were living in that particular area or was it something that people would teach each other on the way to uh, when they were going. The swear word you can be guaranteed kids will know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, okay, just a bit of a practical question. Absolutely. Back to your project, when yeah. are you actually going to do the interviewing, and when can we expect more? Oh, <laughs> thank you. 
Um, I had uh, scheduled, um, I was hoping, I hadn't scheduled anything, I was hoping to do some documentation over Christmas, but I didn't do much. Um, uh, but I'm hoping that next time I go uh, to Greece, which is in Easter, I will have arranged some kind of um, uh, meeting with, especially the guy who lives close to, uh, to me in Athens and try and, and uh, look at what they think about it and hopefully get some more links with other people around um, Greece. Um, but it's a very good question, a very good to set down timeline. So I'm, it's now on camera, so I'm committed to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, David. I'm just kind of dreaming and brainstorming about your talk and I was thinking about some of the, the consequences for revitalization or perhaps what we were talking before about you know, the function being related to the survival, so maybe uh, it, it could be documented but only secretly or, you know, shared with the right circle. But then I was thinking about the way you put it so strongly that the function of the language related to its survival, um, what sort of interesting uh, scenarios that would put for um, a revitalization. Yeah, that would be that would be yeah, that would be very interesting. So, if if the I don't know I don't know if you would revitalize it, um, then uh, I don't know you wouldn't recreate the function as it was as it was. So there's no way you can do that. Well, um, given the Greek economy, you might not. Oh come on, that's mean. No, you wouldn't. Uh, no, you wouldn't. And it's not that bad. Um, so. Um, so, but what you could do though is recreate the uh, sense of uh, belonging to a group. So um, it could be the the language that the group um, the group sees um, talks with. You know, I don't know because there are, there are loads of. Um, um, the, 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 the residents, the, the people who used to live in these villages are now all over the world. So you could recreate the need to belong to a group from all over the world using social, you know, uh, social media or uh, technologies and then get them to use that language for, I don't know, um, learn it or uh, um, as a way to, for them to belong to that group and sort of uh, reclaim their cultural heritage. But you first need to make them proud of it and tell them what it is. So certainly I wouldn't want to recreate, if I were ever to do that, I wouldn't recreate the, um, the function in the, way, the same way it used to be in the 40s and 50s. So uh, it's a very good point though. Thanks. Judy has a, her, has a question. language of a particular function yep. and in a particular dialect of a particular village or area if because you said they spoke it in their village and then went out yeah is it just the dialect of the village which they take with them and then when they're not at home they can use it as a secret language as one does that's very interesting i hadn't thought that way around uh, certainly, the same the, sa the, the language with the same name is mentioned as being spoken by other kinds of trace tradespeople elsewhere. So, Bolyarica is also the, the name of a dialect spoken in Timfristos, which is like again central Greece, but a bit more northern. Um, but it is uh, it is a very interesting point. So, it, was it just what they used to be? Uh, so was it just the language of the village or like the dialects of the village and then they just used it because that's what they could understand that turned out to be secret because nobody else could understand it because they were speaking in a different dialect um, I don't know the answer but it's a very good question thanks Julia um, I guess also um, I'll ask you something afterwards I don't want to, to, you know, take time from this, but I might ask you something afterwards if you um, if you are, are will be there for the drinks. Thanks very much, though. It's a very very val valid point. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? But do they describe it themselves as a Um I don't know. As I said, I, it is. I I have been. I have uh, sources from. Um, third parties, like literature review and people who went there and met these communities, but no, have no account of the communities themselves. It is reported as being a secret one, because they used it for the trade so that I, no one else could understand them, but whether the same people um, define it as 
secret one. I don't know. Yeah. What were the traits of the speaker and rememberers that you that you come to know about? Nowadays. What were their traits? The three people that you. Uh, no, the, the, it, w it wouldn't be them doing the trade. It would be their dad or granddad. So uh, they, they, they used to be sellers, so they would go around and sell stuff. Uh, photographers was also something very common. So they would go around and take pictures and sell them. Um, but the, the, the person, um, um, I don't, uh, I think he's been living in Athens for at least after he was uh, five or six years old, so if not before that. So, um, yeah. How much time do we have? Are we okay for time? Uh, we're, um, David? Yeah. David, David. One final question. I, I come from the third biggest Greek city in the world, Melbourne. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm aware that, you know, whole, whole well, it's a phenomenon we find many places, you know, almost whole villages move you know, to, to yep. other cities and often follow in the footsteps of mm -hmm. their fellow villagers. So I, I wonder, you know, if, if you've looked into the possibility that um, perhaps there might be whole, you know, cohorts of people from mm -hmm. specific villages of interest yep. that have moved to the US or, or, or Australia, Melbourne, um, or other places where there are lots of Greek immigrants. I haven't checked with Australia, but we. Um, but I've checked with uh, um, the states, the United States, so I know there is a um, community centre or community group of people that have emigrated uh, back in the 1940s and 50s from Greece to there, so they have the, the same surname as my granddad. Uh, so quite a few people have um, um, I've managed to track by Facebook as well as uh, why they have like a site where they talk about their village and what they remember about it. So certainly that's a very good, um, another good source to try and uh, find out people that remember or know something about it. Thanks, David. Just imagine there's a bunch of guys in a coffee shop in Chicago talking myself. <laughs> Let's um, thank Katya for thank you. a really interesting talk. Thanks very much for your feedback and comments as well. Despite what she said to me at the beginning, we've actually had, a, I think, a really interesting discussion. Lots of questions, lots of issues yep. have come up. And if you would like to continue talking to Katya about this or other topics, we are going to go to the Institute of Education bar and uh, join us. Uh, come on.